Hello everyone, welcome to this video of connecting the dots in physics. We have been discussing the first module, the Hamiltonian. And before we discuss the third section of the action, I think it is good idea to review two concepts. The first one of them is calculus of variations. In this video, we will review the technique of calculus of variations. Calculus of variations was developed in attempt to solve this Brachistochrone problem. So let's have a quick look of what Brachistochrone problem is. So this is say point A and this is point B. This dashed line here shows that this point B is on the ground while point A is at some height from the ground and obviously here we are considering the situation where gravity is present. The problem is this. Suppose these two points point A and point B are to be connected by some path such that the body then moves under gravity from point A to point B. So what should be the path such that the body moves from point A to point B in least time under influence of gravity. So there is no external force except gravitation which is causing the body to move from A to B and then what should be the path such that the body moves from A to B in least time. So one simplest possibility is that the two points are connected by a straight line by a plane. So you can set up a ramp and then leave a body here so that it then moves under influence of gravity towards point B. So this is point A and this is point B. So this is one of the possibilities that the two points are connected by a straight line by or by a plane. Then there is this second path possible which is now not a straight line but a curved path. This path is such that the body will accelerate more in this region because slope is more and in later it will move with less acceleration. The third possibility can be this where the body now moves in this region with less acceleration but as it goes down the ramp the acceleration goes on increasing. Now how many such paths are possible? Of course there are infinitely many paths possible from point A to point B. I have shown three such paths here which are the dotted lines. Now one thing is true for all these infinitely many paths and that is no matter what is the path taken by the body when it reaches point B its velocity will be same for all these infinitely many paths. Why? Because the body is moving under influence of gravity and gravitational energy is being converted to kinetic energy and since point A is at the same height no matter which path is taken the same gravitational energy is converted to kinetic energy and then you can simply use this equation mgh is equal to half mv square and then v is going to be equal to square root of 2gh where h is this height at which the point b point a is so no matter which path is taken the velocity at point b is going to be same but that cannot be said about the time taken to travel from point A to point B along these paths and our problem now is to find out the path which takes the least time and that is basically the Brachistochrone problem. Now let's try to formulate this problem in terms of mathematical equations. So where do I start? I'll consider this small section here. So this is the small section I'm considering and let's try to find out what is the time taken by the body to cover that distance. Suppose this is small infinitesimally small length dl and that is going to be now equal to this length suppose is dx and this length is dy and therefore I can write dl as square root of dx square plus dy square. So I am considering this small infinitesimally small length along this particular path and we will try to find out how much time the body takes to move through this length. So dt suppose is the time taken by body to cover this path which is going to be equal to 
dl which is length divided by the velocity of the body as it moves along that particular length now since we are considering that dl is infinitesimally small i can say that as the body moves along that particular length dl its velocity is almost constant so i'll i'll consider that the velocity does not change much as it moves along that length and what is going to be the velocity as it moves it is going to be such that kinetic energy half mv square is equal to mg into y where this y is this length below point a so when the body reaches here at this section dl it has lost this much height and therefore it has lost this much of gravitational potential energy which is converted to kinetic energy and therefore we have this equation so i can rearrange this equation and write v as square root of 2 gh so what do i have now i have dt which is equal to dl which i'll write as dx square plus dy square divided by square root of 2g into sorry this has to be y here this is also y and therefore this is equal to dt is equal to square root of dx square plus dy square divided by 2g y i can again rearrange this i'll start writing from here now dt is equal to what i'll do now is i'll take dx square common from the numerator and therefore what i get is 1 plus dy by dx whole square divided by 2g y into dx so dt the small infinitesimally small time taken by the body to travel this distance dl is this relation dt is equal to square root of 1 plus dy by dx whole square divided by 2gy and now if you notice this dy here this dx here is infinitesimally small length and therefore dy by dx is differentiation of y with respect to x which i'll write as, i can write as y dot right generally when we have used this dot notation when i write the x dot it generally means it is dx by dt it is differentiation of x with respect to time we are slightly changing that notation in this case we are saying that y dot is dy by dx so and therefore dt becomes 1 plus y dot whole square divided by 2gy into dt now what is sorry dx now what is total time taken by the object to move from point a to point b to obtain that time what i have to do is i have to integrate this equation from ta to tb and therefore total time taken the, by the body to move along this particular path from point a to point b is given by integration x a to x b square root of 1 plus y dot square divided by 2 g y into dx so it is integration with respect to x so this is how we can formulate the brachisto grown problem now this is total time and what we want is we want the minimum time taken by the problem so what should be a relation between y and x so that this t is minimum that is basically the brachistochrone problem so this is the formulation for the brachistochrone problem this is t and we want to minimize that t such that this particular integration is minimum where y dot is given by dy by dx so what we want is we want y as a function of x which will be the so called path for which this integration this t is minimum let's now write the brachistochrone problem in more general way this is the brachistochrone problem 
and we want to minimize t here if i write it in a general way i can write it like this instead of t now i am using notation i and i have this function j which is function of x x dot which is dx by dt and time in general and i want to now find out condition on this j on this function such that this i is stationary if you compare this particular generalization of rachi stokron problem what is difference first is the difference in notation instead of t now we are using i similarly this is the function which we want to minimize which is function of y dy by dx and x in general instead instead of that here we have x dx by dt and t so basically it is just the difference in the notations the most important difference here is in this case we want to find out minimum t so we want to find out condition on this function so so that this t is minimum whereas in this case we want to find out condition on on j so that i is stationary in general so what is difference between a minimum and the stationary point it is shown in this figure suppose i have this function which is say function of x and this is the function f of x so in this i can say that these are the three points which are all stationary points in this case it is dy by dx is equal to 0 which is true for this point also and which is also true for this point so no matter whether it is a maximum a saddle point or a minimum point for all of them the first differentiation of y with respect to x is zero but the minimum point is this one and for that what we will have is we will have the double differentiation of y with respect to x greater than zero for this point d2y by dx2 is equal to zero and for maximum d2y by dx2 is less than 0 so when we say that we want to find out stationary point it could be any one of these points and what is condition for stationary points the condition for stationary points is first differentiation should be equal to 0 with respect to x or with respect to independent variable now let's try to derive the condition on j so that we get this i to be a stationary point remember we we are not now finding out maximum minimum or saddle we are in general finding out condition of j so that this i is stationary and what is condition for that stationarity it is that the first differentiation of i with respect to all the independent variable should be equal to 0 let's now try to derive that condition so here i'll write this di which is change in i when we change x x dot and t this is equal to integration t a to t b do j by do x dot into delta x dot so this term tells me how much j changes when we change x dot so if delta x dot is the total change that occurs in x dot then j will change by this amount plus do j by do x which is rate with which j changes with x into delta x will give us the change that occurs in j since x is change and this is integrated with respect to time let me reiterate how we got this equation this di is change that occurs in this integration i since we are changing x and x dot this first term here tells how much j changes when x dot is changed and the second term tells by how much j changes since x is changed and total change that occurs is the sum of both these changes now let's first concentrate on the first integration do j 
by dou x dot into delta x dot and it is integrated with respect to time from t a to t b here i can use integration by parts so this is going to be equal to dou j by dou x dot into delta x dot and the limits are t a to t b minus integration t a to t b this dou first term is differentiated with respect to time once and then we have to integrate the second term which is simply delta x with respect to and the integration is with respect to time di therefore is equal to integration from t a to t b now let's first consider this term if we consider this term this can this has to be delta x only then we are cons this delta x is variation in the path in x at t a and t b but remember that these two are the fixed points and therefore delta x should be equal to zero so this first term vanishes we only have to take care of the second term so that term is d by dt of dou j by dou x dot into delta x dot and the second term is this term which is dou j by dou, dou x into delta x and the integration is with respect to time so this then becomes integration from t a to t b this is now d dt minus of d dt of dou j by dou x dot plus dou j by dou x i am taking delta x common and the integration is with respect to time so this is what we have this is t b so let me again write i or d delta i here it is integration t a to t b minus d d t of dou j by dou x dot plus dou j by dou x into delta x and the integration is with respect to time so what we want for i to be stationary is d i should be equal to zero because it is stationary point its first differentiation should be equal to zero now in this integration either this term should be equal to for d i to be equal to zero or this term to be equal to zero what is delta x delta x is variation in the path so if the body is moving from this two points t a to t b and if i consider this path and this path and then there could be some other path like this so delta x basically is representing the variation in this path which cannot be zero it is zero only at t a and t b since these are the fixed points and that's why here we have the first term to be equal to zero but in general at rest of the points that delta x cannot be zero and if delta x cannot be zero that means we should have d by dt into dou j by dou x dot minus dou j by dou x is it should be equal to zero and this is basically the condition on j so that i is stationary so this is the condition on j so that i is stationary or we have the stationary point now you may already have noticed that this equation is very similar to lagrangian equation of motion so this is basically the lagrangian equation of motion and this is condition of j that we have obtained by calculus of variation and they are very similar in fact this lagrange's equation or euler lagrange's equation as it is called can be derived by using hamilton's principle of action and by using calculus of variation which we will do when we discuss 
uh, the third section the action here I just wanted to have a quick review of this derivation for calculus of variation this is the reference book that I have used while preparing for this video of course this is one of the books the there are other different references that I have used but this is the primary reference and though I have left out Goldstein's book uh, that also is a very good book to see the derivation in next video we will review the modern formulation of quantum mechanics which uses bra kits and operators in the main section of 1.3 we will discuss the principle hamilton's principle of action and we will derive lagrange's equation of motion from that we will quickly see the concepts of propagators in quantum mechanics and we will briefly introduce the third formulation of quantum mechanics due to Feynman which is path integration formulation. Thank you for watching this video.